Good morning, everybody. Welcome to our virtual keeper chat live from the Buttonwood Park Zoo in New Bedford. It's a beautiful day here. I feel a little bit like a Disney princess with all these birds running over to us. Um, if you've been here before, you recognize that we are on the animal side of an exhibit today. Oh, and there's our sandhill cranes giving us a hello. We are in our bison exhibit. Uh, obviously, we would not be able to be in here if our bison was out. We are visiting with some of our feathered friends today, and we are joined by our director, Keith Lovett. So I'm going to turn it over to him, and we'll get started. Good morning, everyone. Um, as Carrie said, we are in our bison exhibit. For safety reasons, we have shifted Sarah, our bison, into her barn. So she's being fed up in her barn right now. Um, and as soon as we're done here, she'll be led back out. But we want to be able to get up close and personal with some of the waterfowl we have here at the zoo. Obviously, the Bunny Park Zoo, for anyone who has followed us and been to the zoo, we have a large uh, population of waterfowl species here at the zoo. And we have some very unique species, endangered species, some species that uh, we are very active in involved in trying to save in the wild as well. So we're going to talk about all these great species today. So come on with your questions. All right, so, and I will say we are joined as well by one of our keepers, Katie, who you know. Katie, can we just start real quick by just saying what it is you're feeding them? People like to see yeah, what it is so we're feeding the them. The main thing I'm feeding them is this grain, so it was specifically designed for waterfowl. Okay. And I've also got some grapes and romaine lettuce, which they also really love. All right, so Keith, I don't know if you want to introduce us to, to some of your screen. favorite species oh my god there are so many different species <laughs> out here i can zoom in on fo on our particular want to start with these guys so right here that is actually a very unique species that is a hawaiian goose also known as a nene goose n-e-n-e -E -N -E. um, this is a species that's found um, through hawaii through the various islands of hawaii it's a species that almost went extinct in the wild and because the u.s fish and wildlife service and some captive breeding programs it was actually able to be saved it's now actually a vulnerable species it's doing better than it very active, very vocal species. All right, and were these guys born here at the zoo? The, uh, some of these were born, uh, Katie, sorry, God, Katie, which ones were born here? Uh, two of them, right? There's those two, the one in the middle is their mother. The one in the middle is their mother. Unfortunately, their father had passed away. He was over 20 years of age when he passed away, so that is unfortunate. But in the future, we will get her a new mate. We're working on that right now. But these are two of her kids that were born at the zoo a couple years ago. And would the males look similar to this, or are they sexually They're a little dimorphic? bit larger, typically, but not significantly larger. So for the average person looking at them, you're not going to notice a significant difference. You'll notice that the mother is a little bit smaller than the sons here. Um, that is the biggest difference. Aside from that, there's very difficult to tell them apart. All right, and we have some other beautiful geese right here. Those are a very unique species. We're one of the only zoos in the country that has this. Those are actually female or girl Magellan geese. This is a species found through southern South America. Um, they are a shell geese species, which is just a designation of the type of um, goose they are. They are an aggressive species. They're actually one of the more aggressive and dominant species here at the zoo. Um, this is another species that um, numbers are very poor in zoos and we're actually trying to improve them. We actually have two males coming in very soon to set up breeding programs for these guys. Oh, and who's that that was just talking to us? That's one of, uh, that is the female, the male in the back. Those are Australian wood ducks, also called Maine geese. Um, this is one of the only Australian species we have at the zoo. Um, they are a small species. They're also known as Australian wood ducks. They're more of a duck species than a goose species. Um, but we have three pairs here at the zoo. Um, this time of year, they are pairing off. We actually have seen egg production. They've already laying eggs, and we expect a couple to be hatching in the next few days. Uh, so that is another neat species here at the zoo. And what about, uh, oh, go ahead. What about these beautiful guys oh, over here? Goofy geese in the back there. That is actually another... Well, we got two species there, right? <laughs> There's two of them. The big... Oh, God. Three. <laughs> I'm not sure Parsley knows he's a different species. So we have a variety of species here. Those are swan geese. This is a species found in northern Europe, up through Russia. It is a cold weather species. Um, it is an endangered species and part of the captive breeding program here at the zoo. Um, you will often see geese that look like this in some um, farms right here. Um, there are domesticated swan geese. These are the wild form of these swan geese. 
species. Um, as I said, they are an endangered species. In the middle of them is one of the geese that we hand raise. This is basically our ambassador geese that we use for a lot of education programs here at the zoo. This is an animal that was, nest was abandoned in the zoo, incubated its egg and raised it. Often when you um, raise geese, they become imprinted on their parents. In this case, it was humans. So this goose is very much um, people oriented. For whatever reason, when she's out, he's out in the yard here, he doesn't hang out with the other pink-footed goose, because that is a pink-footed goose found through Greenland and other parts of Northern Europe. He hangs out with the swan goose. For whatever reason, he thinks he's a swan goose at this point. Now, these swan geese, are they all one particular sex? Are they males and females? We have males and females in this group. This is part of a genetic breeding program to maximize the genetic diversity. So this is a breeding program that we have at the zoo with other zoos around the country and around the world. They're beautiful. What about... Um, we had this this guy oh, over that here. That is another female goose species. Believe it or not, that is the smaller of the um, sexes. The males are much larger. That is an Andean goose. Similar to the Magellan goose, this is a species that is found through southern South America, throughout Chile, Chile, uh, Argentina. Um, another aggressive goose species um, in the sense that they, um, they let everybody know that they're around. Um, but they are a shell goose species, but this is a very unique species. They're a species that spends very little time on water. They spend more time on land. They have a smaller bill. Um, they're a grass eaters more than anything else. But it's a very unique species here at the zoo as well. And we have someone else coming to join us up oh, here. We have the Ross Goose. It's Katie Ross Goose. Uh, this is a species found through Canada in the basically central part of the United States. Um, we actually, this is the son, correct? Yep. This is a little boy. He's about two years old now. His parents are no longer around him because they're off in another section of this habitat over on the far left side. They're actually on a nest right now. So they actually are have three eggs, Katie? Yes, they do. They have three eggs right now. So they kind of have left him to hang out with the other geese as the Indian geese chases them off. See what I said about aggression? And they're actually laying eggs right now or incubating eggs right now. And we should have more Ross goose very soon. And who do we have right here? That is, is the male main goose. Okay, so we that is our, another male goose. You also notice that we have a lot of, um, not to be rude here, some freeloaders that have come yes. in as well. We have a ton of mallards that have flown in um, trying to get a free meal off the zoo, which is okay because it's very nutritious food that we are giving them. Uh, there is a North American wood duck that is a native um, species around here as well. Yes, that is the Andean goose. Oh, no, yeah, I meant the other wood duck over there. The other wood duck over there. <laughs> oh, boy. <laughs> So we had a few questions come in. Um, all right, so we had a question about, is there, uh, Gwen, age 11, wanted to know, is there a leader of the pack? Is there a particular species that kind of runs the show? So it depends on species. The more aggressive species out here are the Andean geese and the Magellan geese. Um, typically, particularly during breeding season, the males are gonna be more aggressive than the females. Since we only have female Andean geese and female Magellan geese, and that was by design because they can be incredibly challenging when you have many different species because they will be dominant and aggressive. But typically it's going to be the male goose who is the leader of the pack, and especially during breeding season. But as far as species goes, Magellan geese and Andean geese are definitely the more dominant species. And we do have a couple Canada geese over here. That Those are flying Canada geese. Yeah. Um, which uh, would bring up a good question that Joy asked about why all these um, waterfowl are not flying away. So some of them have flighted. So a lot of the animals out here in these open top enclosures, we have trimmed their wings to prevent them from flying. So a lot of these guys are much more land oriented and so they stay at the zoo and stay safe. We have trimmed their wings. Trust me, Katie spends a lot of her time training the birds to come into a corral so that we can pick them up and trim their feathers. So a lot of work here at the zoo, but um, it works out very well. And we've created a great home for them. Right, right there, if you want to show that species right there, those are northern pintails. That male is in beautiful breeding color right now. And the reason he's called a pintail, you see how elongated the end of that fe tail feathers are? There's a bunch of mallards in there. There's two girls hanging them. The one right next to him is actually a female pintail. Looks very similar to a uh, female mallard. There we go. There's a male. There you go. I'm noticing that ducks are definitely giving way to the geese. In general, are ducks less aggressive than a goose? Yes, very much aggressive. So. 
this is not a free-for-all. We're very selective of the species that we put in here. We're very versed in what species can work together. Um, we even have to take consideration the fly-ins. That pair of Canada geese right there, they're going to be coming back here every year because they lay their eggs here at the zoo. So they lay their eggs, raise up their goslins, and then they fly off for the rest of the year. So they're only here for about six or seven weeks a year. Okay. Um, do they have names? Depends on the goose. When you have this many geese out there, it's kind of tough to name them all. Trying to name, try to name a couple hundred children can be a little bit challenging. But a few of them, like Parsley, who was part of our ambassador program right there, <laughs> is beautiful Parsley. Um, some of them do have names. If you want to show the emperor goose, that is a very unique species found through on the west coast of the United States, up through Canada, up through Alaska. This is a threatened species. That is the emperor goose. Uh, this is a program that is very much involved. Uh, the Bum Buttonwood Park Zoo is very much involved with as far as the breeding program as well. Um, do you know if they have, or do we have any babies happening out here right now? So right now we have a variety of nests. Um, we have not had any in this exhibit hatch yet, but right now we have Ross Goose who are on eggs. Um, two nests of pink right, right goose. There. Parsley's um, parents are actually on eggs right now. We have another species called lesser white-fronted gooses on eggs. And I'm sure there are uh, pintails and wood ducks and other species. We have had mallards hatch here, wild mallards, and also wild wood ducks hatch. Here in Massachusetts, we have a tendency to see the nesting season help it happen a little bit later than the rest of the country, being in our cold climate here. All right, we have a couple um, over here that we haven't talked about yet. Probably, I would say, the most beautiful goose species we have to do. It's a small goose species called the red-breasted goose. Um, this is a European, uh, northern European species um, through Asia as well. Um, and that is an endangered species. This is, again, another captive breeding program that we have here at the zoo. But those are red-breasted geese. We have three pairs of red-breasted geese um, at the Buttonwood Park Zoo. Lindsay, thank you so much for your donation. That is uh, really helpful during this time of closure when we don't have guests on site. It helps us to keep our conservation education mission alive. Um, any, any nest we can see around here? Or go over to take footage? They're a little aggressive, but we can get a little closer. While we're walking that way, Kaiden would like to know if you have a favorite duck or goose species, Keith. In general, there's two types of ducks and geese. So some of them we don't even have in the zoo because we don't have the right climate. Whistling ducks, um, there are several species of whistling ducks that are probably I'm very fond of. And from that is the shell ducks and the shell geese. So we do have some shell geese here, the Andean geese, um, the Magellan geese. So a lot of those species are my favorite. So it's whistling ducks and shell geese. What we're coming up to here is actually have a pink-footed nest. Now, don't be surprised if all of a sudden that male pink-footed goose comes and attacks us, part of working at a zoo. But you can see she has formed a nest. That nest has some different types of grasses. Um, they pick a lot of their down, and here he oh, comes. <laughs> He's actually directing it towards the lesser white-fronted goose. But you can see they're very protective of the nest. She's on how many eggs right now, Katie? Four. Four eggs right now. Um, you can see they've gone up on the rock area there. They're on the nest, and she will sit tight. She's on that nest about 23 hours a day. When she comes off the nest, the male is protecting that nest, and trust me, she's not letting anybody else near it. So will she come off to eat at all, or does they she do stay on there? They do come off to eat um, once or twice a day. They do come off to eat. So and will does. the male sit on them during that time? Sometimes, <laughs> but oftentimes he just protects the nest. You can see he's... <laughs> he is not <laughs> having it. As you can see, anyone gets too close, this is what happens. Um, Katie, maybe you can answer this question. Do these guys have a favorite keeper? Or do they just like whoever has food with them today? Um, most of them, it's whoever has food. But for Parsley, I would say it's it's either myself or another keeper, Steph. Um, we were the two that hand raised him. All right, we have another species that joined us right here. That Keith? is a lesser white-fronted goose. You see the very small white patch at the front of its bill or above its bill. That is called why it's called a lesser white-fronted goose. It has those beautiful yellow gold um, outlines of the eyes that you can see right there. Um, that is again another endangered species here at the zoo, and we're happy to say that. <coughs> This is the male, the female's on the other side of the habitat. This is over a one acre habitat. Um, and she's actually on nests right now as well. That'll be the first time we have bred the species at the zoo. Um, we have another 
duck species oh, that right is here. A diving duck species. That is, I assume you pointed to the hooded meganser. Yep. Hooded meganser is a diving duck species. It's one of the smallest duck species we have out here. That is a male. He's starting to lose his color right now. He's still quite beautiful, but his feathers are getting a little drab. That's because he's coming out of breeding season. Uh, we do have some hooded meganser eggs at the zoo right now that will be hatching out in the next 10 days or so. So we should have some hooded meganser. But that is a male hooded meganser. There's some females out here somewhere, but we don't see them right now. Is this one with the nope. brown head? What is that? That is actually a very good pickup. Wrong species, but good pickup, <laughs> Carrie. That is a female common golden eye, also known as an American golden eye. Okay. Um, that is another diving duck species, a small duck species that occasionally can be seen in this area, particularly out on coastal areas. But that is a common golden eye. I've seen them through Dartmouth. I've seen them out in New Bedford as well. So that brings up a good point. We have so many different species here and a lot of people are only familiar with the mallards and the Canada geese that they see mm -hmm. in their local community. But really, they could see a lot of other species. I think people would be surprised to learn that we have marine waterfowl. You see a lot of waterfowl this time of year who are on the coastal areas of Massachusetts. So if you're down um, in the south end of New Bedford along the beaches, if you go... Um, um, through Dartmouth, over the bridges in Dartmouth, even in Westport, you'll see a lot of different species. Um, one of the more common species that you see out there are brant geese. They're out there, American black ducks. Buffleheads is a very small duck species you see out there. Uh, but we see um, sea ducks in the form of eiders and scoters. So you'd be surprised, although you see mostly Canada geese, wood ducks occasionally, mallards occasionally. You might see a gadwall inland. When you get the coastal, you see a lot of diversity of waterfowl. And in general, what would you say if we were to go out and look for waterfowl? A lot of people think it's fun to feed them like Katie's doing right now. Can you talk a little bit about how to do that safely for the animals? If you're going to feed waterfowl, um, the last thing you want to do is bread. Bread is basically calories without any real nutritional value. And particularly with a species that is being raised up or growing, a juvenile or a subadult, it can cause actual deformities in their growth and cause something called angel wing, where their wing is completely malformed. Um, a better option is different types of lettuces, greens. Those would be the best things that you could feed waterfowl if you're going out to a park in this area and feeding waterfowl. Um, what would be a duck's predator? So the most common predators, although there are land-based predators, otters, minks, um, even something like a bobcat or a fisher might go after them, the most common predators for these guys is going to be um, birds of prey. Maybe a large red-tailed hawk, but usually owl species, particularly great horn owl when they're nesting, are going to be the largest predator or the most prominent predator for these guys. And who's this guy coming out with the brown head over here? The redhead? Yeah. The brown head? You mean the redhead? The redhead, right. Redhead. I didn't want to give it away. Okay, it's a red-headed <laughs> duck. That is a male, a male and, a and a female. The female is a goofy one walking like that. Again, these are diver ducks. The biggest difference you'll see is that their legs are set back further in their body. So that's a male and female redhead who are designed to be on water more than they're designed to be on land. Their legs are set further back to help them make them excellent swimmers, but makes them really goofy on land. Um, Tegan has a great question about why all these um, different species have different colored feet. Well, the feet have to do with the color in the feet or the general coloration of the birds has to do with a variety of different things. Typically with waterfowl, the female are going to be a much more drab brown. We've pointed out a bunch of females out here and they usually are not splashy in color. Um, that's because their job in part is to nest in the wild and they want to blend into their environment. They want to have a straw nest or in a vegetation and being that drab brown color actually actually lets them to be camouflaged. The male's job in this role is to be as beautiful as possible. Think of a peacock who basically is going to show off as much as he can so that he can attract the most females or the best looking females or the desirable female what have you. So the male is to be a big proud peacock and is strut around and protect the females and the females job is to nest and as, as a result they have drab camouflage to help them blend into the environment and can oh, good i was going to say can you talk a little bit about the difference in foot color like some are orange so some color, are yellow yeah, some are black there's no significance it's just the various um, colors that have evolved through evolution one color doesn't mean one thing it isn't that mean an orange foot means something different than a black foot it's just how these species have evolved for their environments for their camouflage i will say if you watch this a little 
little bit. There is a lot of aggression that happens out here. None of it is serious. Nobody's getting hurt out here. But this is how Dominic Geese and Swan, there's a competition in the wild for food. And these guys are all trying to make sure they get as close to Katie as possible. Katie is, you know, <laughs> the godsend right now, throwing them food. So they're trying to get as close as possible to Katie. And Tana Age 8 has a good question about the diving ducks that you talked about. How long can they stay underwater? Depends on the species. They're usually not going to stay underwater for more than 30 seconds. They can push out a little bit. They probably can stay underwater for a couple minutes, especially some of your marine species like eyers and what have you. Your species that can dive the furthest, if you're looking for that, there would actually be a European Asian species called the tufted duck, which is somewhat related to the red-headed duck here at the zoo. But usually they're only going to be under for 10, 15, 20 seconds. Sometimes if they're trying to flee a predator, they can go down further. Typically when they're diving, they're diving to the bottom and getting vegetation and various types of food items off the bottom. So they're typically diving for two reasons. One, to find food, which is the prominent reason they do it. And the second reason is to avoid predation or aggression from another species. Uh, Miles, age 10, asked a good question about why we have so many ducks. Why, and I guess I would add on, why do you think it's important for an AZA accredited zoo to have a variety of waterfowl species. I think we have so many ducks because the director of the zoo is a little bit crazy, um, <laughs> who, who's really into waterfowl. Um, I am definitely, I will take a lot of the blame credit, which way you see it, that we have so many waterfowl species here at the zoo. I run a lot of programs in the Association of Zoos and Aquariums for waterfowl. From a zoological standpoint, it's a species we can do very well. And the reason we can do very well is that most waterfowl are very tolerant to cold temperatures that we have here in Massachusetts, but just as important or more important we have a lot of water in the zoo. Although we're only seven acres, we do have a lot of semi-aquatic habitat that are very well suited. You can take this acre-long paddock here at the zoo that has bison and sandhill cranes, but there's no competition to a bison if you have geese in here. So it is actually a perfect habitat for some of these um, species that we have here at the zoo. Um, we do focus on endangered species, endangered waterfowl species, and we have several breeding programs here at the zoo focused on endangered species. Um, so it's just how we can um, give back to wildlife. Um, we are a small zoo, so some of the species that we don't have the space for, um, we can't do as well, but waterfowl we can do very well. There's a really good look at that pintail. You can really tell how they get their name. Yes. I think Serenity Love may be able to stump Keith on a duck question. How many bones do they have? Congratulations, you just stumped me. I do not. I can answer humans and I can answer some primate species, one of my other specialties. I can't answer that question off the top of my head, but I will definitely look it up and we'll have to get that answer for you. Do you want to talk a little bit about their skeletal structure? Does it help them to, to fly? Or? So a lot of people look at these species and they assume, wow, that's a big bird. That must be a heavy bird. And you'd be surprised. They're really not that heavy I mean, relative to what they look like. A Canada goose is going to be heavier than a mallard, but have you. And the reason for that is when a bird has to fly, its bones are much more hollow. Um, to allow excessive weight would not allow them to be good flyers. So their bones are very streamlined. A lot of their bones are hollow to allow for better flight. So what looks like an incredibly heavy bird, you'd be surprised how light they are actually. Excellent. I think we have run through all of our questions. My last question would be um, waterfowl species. You talked about I'm having... Sorry, Ventura, we oh. do have the pair of lesser white-fronted goose. So she is off the nest right now. Mm. Let's go for a walk. So we're going to keep this talk going for a few minutes. So that's another question, Terry. So my question was to follow up on your um, talk about endangered species. What is going on with waterfowl in the world? Why are there so many that are in trouble right now? It's not just waterfowl, it's water birds. It's anything in an aquatic environment. So across the planet, we have significant challenges with regard to keeping our wetlands um, clean, safe, um, in place. There's been so much destruction of wetland habitats and so much pollution of wetland habitats that we have seen the impact on <laughs> birds and mammals and frogs and fish that rely on these wetland habitats. So you're gonna do a Those are. Oh boy, this is when Carrie falls in the water on live on camera, so Facebook. Fun. Yeah. I just love how they follow us. <laughs> You'll have to excuse my camera work while I do this. Well, this is very interesting. This is the nest of a lesser white-fronted goose. 
Uh, upon looking at this, um, those aren't the same species. There are two different eggs in here. One of them is a lesser white fronted goose. The other one is another species. I'm going to have to look at it a little bit closer to determine what species it is. So basically what happened is either someone had started a nest, one of the larger duck species, and the lesser white fronts took it over, or someone is dumping their eggs these are two different species that the lesser white fronted goose is sitting on right now. This is the lesser white fronted goose's down. They use this down to sit it along the nest. And for those of you where we're not going to disturb the nest, waterfowl at this stage are going to go right back to this nest as soon as we're done here. Um, it's very natural for them to come off and we get counts. But these are two different eggs, two different species we have here at the zoo. Uh, what will happen if a different species hatches with her? They will imprint, very similar to a human raising a waterfowl. The, whatever species that is that hatches, it will imprint on the lesser white-fronted goose as well. So you may see a goofy uh, <laughs> duck or goose species hanging out with the lesser white-fronted goose. No different than Parsi, who hangs out with the swan goose, even though it's a pink-footed goose. Um, we had a question about why they walk so funny. Why does a duck waddle? Depends on the species. Some species, some of the geese species, are incredibly good at walking. Uh, they spend more time on land. Some of the duck species like mallards are also very good on land. Diving ducks, the redheads, the hooded the golden eyes that are out here, they are goofy on land because they spend most of the time on water. The legs are set back further and they're just not well suited to be on um, land. Excellent. All right. Well, I want to thank everyone for joining us today for this um, keeper chat. I hope that you learned a lot about these different species. This is a, definitely a favorite exhibit of our visitors when you come back. You'll be able to feed the ducks again and now you'll know a little bit more about them when you do. So thank you Keith for introducing us to these interesting species. Thank you Katie. Thank you Waterfowl. We'll see you guys next week. Oh, we have a question that came in that I feel like we should ask. Ryan wants to know are there a lot of green and yellow SSPs for waterfowl or the majority candidate programs? Most of them are yellow SSPs. There are a few red SSPs, but the majority of them are yellow SSP. For the person who is not into zoo lingo, um, we rank SSPs or breeding programs based on the populations. The more genetically diverse, the more healthier, healthier the genetics in the population, the higher ranking it has. A lot of the waterfowl programs that have historically struggled, they're considered yellow SSP means that they're, they're cautiously doing well, um, but they, there is room for improvement. So the, most of them are yellow SSPs. Awesome. And we were getting a lot of thank yous. People really loved this. So thank you very much. We'll see you guys for another edition of Virtual Keeper Chats. Maybe.